around the camera. Um, as usual, I will at least try and mute everybody with the exception of our speaker. Um, when the speaker has finished speaking, we will unmute you and you can yeah. then ask questions uh, and discuss and generally chat, but I hope reasonably uh, in order, otherwise it gets completely chaotic. So let me first of all try and mute everybody uh, and ask Deborah Cohen if she would kindly unmute herself and then we can welcome her formally to top of the hill. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Deborah is a local resident, it said in her very brief biography that I've got, and recently retired from a management career in the health service and adult social care. And she is going to talk to us um, as the penultimate talk leading up to uh, the Yomim Naraim. Uh, she's going to talk to us introducing the House of Life at Wilsdon Cemetery. Now, Deborah became a volunteer guide and a speaker for Wilsdon Jewish Cemetery last summer. And she describes, uh, according to this book of instructions, she describes this as being on a voyage of discovery as she learns more and more about famous and not so famous people. The possibly infamous people was my insertion, not hers, from all walks of life who are buried in Wilsdon. So it is with great pleasure that I shall hand over to Deborah. Thank you. Deborah, Thank you. all yours. I'm going to share my screen because I have a slide presentation. So, uh, here we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that and can hear me. Um, I'm just going to move that right. Okay, so um, thank you for your introduction, David. Um, I live quite near the cemetery, which as we know, once upon a time was a very, very um, well populated area by Jewish people. Um, it kind of declined as an area for Jewish people. And in recent years, it's um, come back again, come back into fashion. Um, the cemetery received a £1.7 million grant from the National Lottery last year. And um, it's also registered as a notable park and garden. It's the only Jewish cemetery to have that um, accolade. And um, the, the uh, reason for the lottery, uh, National Lottery giving it this grant was firstly, is part of a big program of lottery grants to all things Victorian. And um, I'll say a bit more about the context of the cemetery as a Victorian cemetery. But secondly, I think it's in recognition of the, um, of the great history, social history that lies within this cemetery. Um, and that's what I hope to convey to you today. Um, in the introduction, I said famous and not so famous because um, while obviously I've been learning loads about the famous people who are buried in the cemetery and um, there are far too many to possibly, uh, it would take you probably about two years worth of lectures to talk about them. Um, the other thing is, is that people are always saying to me, oh, my relatives are buried in Wilson Cemetery. And actually, I've been to see quite a number of the graves of uh, relatives of friends as well, who are not famous, but um, also have very interesting lives, which um, I think we should start to write up. So... Um, Oh, I'm trying to move it on. Um, just there. That's it. Okay. This is a drone picture of the cemetery. Um, it was opened in 1973 and um, it was um, bought 12 acres of land bought from All Souls College, Oxford. Anyone who knows Wilsdon will know that there's an All Souls Avenue in Wilsdon and it seems that a lot of the land in that area was in fact owned by All Souls. 
Um, they only used five acres to begin with, and it was extended twice in 1890 and 1907. And it was just agricultural la land uh, before it was built. And Willsdon was just a very small village. Um, just to sort of anchor where this is, this is the back of the cemetery. And behind it is another cemetery. That is Wilson Liberal Cemetery, which was opened in 1914. And there is a gate between the two cemeteries, which is normally open on a Sunday if you want to go from one to the other. Um, down uh, the right hand side of the screen is a, another cemetery, which is a Christian stroke civic cemetery, which was opened in 1891. In the top right hand corner um, is Roundwood Park, opened in about 1890. Again, a Victorian and another Victorian thing park. And the bus station in Pound Lane is down this side on the left. The entrance is off the picture at the bottom of the screen. And you come in on the left is the visitor centre. There's car park, a limited amount of car parking here. And then it opens out in the funereal buildings and behind that is the avenue of trees. Okay, um, so moving on. This is a close-up picture of the avenue of trees that we were looking at from, uh, from above before. Um, the cemetery is a United Synagogue Cemetery, and I'll talk a bit more about its founding um, when we talk about the Chief Rabbi Nathan Adler. Okay. Um, this is a close-up of the funereal buildings um, on the um, on the left. Here is a building for the Kohanim who traditionally do not go onto the graves or they will stick to the paths. And on the right hand side is the Tahara house, which is uh, where the bodies are um, cleaned and looked after. And when funerals happen, the uh, coffin goes in through here into the prayer hall behind and then out the far side before actual internment. Um, this area outside is called the portico and it was actually an add-on in 1929 to protect mourners from the from the rain. Um, I have actually jumped over everything about Jewish burial customs and about mourning and the shiver because I'm assuming as I'm talking to Ashul that everybody knows all about that. But if anybody wants to ask any questions, I will pause. Please do ask. Um, you appreciate we give a quite a lot of talks to non-Jewish audiences, who are, and and they're often very very interested in um, Jewish burial traditions. So the um, prayer hall itself. So this is the building that's behind the portico, and this is the exit for the body. Um, I think it looks remarkably like a Methodist hall, but actually it's um, neo-Gothic in style, which was very fashionable in Victorian times. And it was, um, it was designed by an architect, uh, Lewis Solomon, and his son, Nathan Solomon Joseph, and Nathan Solomon Joseph also designed St. Petersburg Place Shaw, the new West End synagogue, as you might know. Um, these buildings are all listed by Heritage England. Um, so just a quick word, um, as I mentioned, that the lottery grants, uh, the lottery are giving a lot of money to Victorian institutions. And Victorian and cemeteries were to a large extent a Victorian invention, which is something I hadn't ever thought about until I got involved in the cemetery project. Um, 
But until uh, Victorian times, people tended to be buried in small graveyards, normally associated with a church or a synagogue. So you can go to the East End today and you can see there are a number of very small Jewish cemeteries. Normally they're walled and they're locked and you have to go and find the relevant person to get access into them. Um, and uh, in, um, 18, in the 1830s into the early 1840s, there was a lot of concern about pollution of the kind of the water table and the sewers by um, bodies because the cemeteries were, uh, the graveyards, church graveyards were overflowing. And so seven, uh, what were called the seven magnificent large private cemeteries were opened. Um, the first one was in Kensal Green in 1833, that's quite near um, Wilson Jewish Cemetery. But one of them, the most famous, is probably Highgate Cemetery, which a number of you may have visited. Um, now, there's this particular architectural style and style of uh, gravestones. And Wilson Jewish Cemetery is a perfect example of that. If you wander around Kensal Cemetery, which I have a few times, um, it looks very similar to Wilson Jewish Cemetery, um, which I find quite interesting. Um, this picture is of uh, just a random shot of the, of the Victorian part of the cemetery. Um, and this grave is restored grave of the very fir first person who was buried in the cemetery. And I'll talk about him in a moment. But just sticking with um, the Victoriana aspects of, um, of the cemetery, um, here you can see the um, obelisk, which is, was a very popular design. Um, the, the life cut short, the idea of a column with this kind of diagonal cut at the top, um, you is is probably one of the most common Victorian grave um, stones that you will you will see. Um, urns. These are not. Uh, these are just decorative. Um, as you know, uh, Orthodox Jews do not cremate, so they're not um, urns that contain ashes. They're just decorative. And then there is um, there are a couple of quite grand. Um, graves um, within the cemetery and this one belongs to the Samuel family which I'll say a bit more about later. Um, the insignias on, um, on gravestones, um, back in the day in Victorian times they put a lot more information on gravestones than they do today. They would often uh, write where the person lived, their full address, what their occupation was, which is great for historians who come along now. Um, and I wish that that practice was still the case, thinking forward a hundred years time. You know, if you wander around Bushy, um, it doesn't tell you where the person lived or what they did or very little about them. Um, the actual symbols though have stayed really the same. So this would be uh, an Asian Hyle, uh, the sign of a Jewish person, a Sadiq, um, a, um, a Cohen uh, saying, uh, the, uh, ble uh, the, saying the priestly blessing. And of course the Kohenim, as is traditional, tend to be buried uh, right up against the path so that their re male relatives who are Kohenim can uh, actually see them, see their graves. Um, this is um, a war memorial erected by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and it's the first one of its sort in a Jewish in a Jewish um, cemetery. And it has a listing as a, it's a, got a grade two listing. It's a memorial to those uh, Jewish soldiers who died in the First and the um, Second World War. The inscription says, this memorial honours those of the Jewish faith who fell while serving in the forces of the Commonwealth in the two world wars. Their names live forevermore. Um, and in the cemetery, there are 33 First World War 
Commonwealth graves and 78 Second World War Commonwealth graves. Um, the First World War number is low, lower because um, many people, unfortunately soldiers who died in the First World War, their bodies were not brought back and they're buried in the cemeteries in northern France. Um, there is a volunteer who's doing quite a lot of work on uh, Jewish soldiers who are buried within the cemetery to find out something about their histories and to try and match them back to their um, parents. There are a number of graves, um, older Victorian graves, where there are little tokens on the foot, which are memorials to children who died in the First World War, but where the bodies weren't repatriated. So um, that's, uh, that requires quite a lot of painstaking research, as you might well imagine. Um, there are also um, remembrance boards in the, um, in the portico and um, of names of um, as many Jewish people as we could gather who died in the world wars. But also uh, there's a plaque for those Jews who died during the Boer War. Um, that plaque, it is believed, was actually on the synagogue in Great Portland Street. But because of um, the, the bombings in the Second World War, it was moved out to Wilsdon. Um, there's also uh, here a group of Australian soldiers buried in the cemetery. So um, just to um, pause there for a moment um, before I actually uh, move on to talk about some of the individuals who are buried there. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions at this point or do you want to wait till the end? I think it might be better if we wait till the end. Okay. Is All that right. okay with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, it's, it's really, really difficult to choose who, who to talk about and how many people and whether to talk about lots of people and not say much about each of them or to talk about a few in depth. So I kind of gone for a, um, a bit of a mix. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, the Chief Rabbi Nathan Adler and his son Herman Adler. Um, Nathan Adler was, Rabbi Adler was the second um, Chief Rabbi, the longest serving Chief Rabbi that we've had to date in this country. And he's really important because he's the person who's responsible for the cemetery, uh, opened in 1873. Um, he's also responsible for founding United Synagogue in 1870, which was an amalgamation of um, six existing synagogues, including the Great Synagogue, the New Synagogue, Central and Bayswater Synagogues. And United Synagogue as a body is uh, recognised in statute. And that's very, very, very unusual um, and uh, for, for a Jewish organization to actually have legal recognition in that way. Um, he also uh, founded Jews College um, because he thought that the clergy were not sufficiently educated in um, Britain. So he left quite an amazing legacy. Um, he himself was born in Hanover in 1808 and remember that's where Queen Victoria came from and um, he was a very well educated man um, within uh, Hanover, within Prussia, um, but he didn't speak any English and the story goes that when he took up his post in England part of the condition of his contract was he had to learn to speak English. Um, he was elected chief rabbi in 1844 so in those days they had elections and his biographer somebody called Derek Taylor tells the story 
which um, could just be an anecdote, but it's quite interesting, that the election was fixed by Moses Montefiore and Lionel de Rothschild at the time because um, Queen Victoria had expressed um, a view and that she was keen that he be her chief rabbi because he was from Hanover. Um, the interesting thing was that he's often called the father of Minhag Anglia in that he encouraged the development of an English approach um, of there being a balance between Jewish and secular observance and the, the idea of remaining grateful to your home country. Um, his son, who took over uh, from, uh, the, from Nathan, because Nathan in later years suffered from uh, ill health, um, was also born in Hanover, but came to the UK when he was age five. And um, there's a really funny story told that one day Herman Adler was having lunch with the British Catholic Cardinal Herbert Vaughan, Catholic Cardinal. And the Cardinal asked the rabbi, when, Dr. Adler, may I have the pleasure of helping you to some ham? And Rabbi Adler replied, at your wedding, your eminence. <laughs> Think about that one. <laughs> Very um, quick-witted, I'd say, that is. Um, okay. The rabbonim are the of, of the Victorian rabbonim are all buried um, on on either side of the avenue of trees, kind of in pride of place. Uh, there are many many other rabbis uh, buried around the cemetery, but obviously the more recent deaths are buried in the more modern part of the um, cemetery. Um, the person who uh, kind of completes this trio who's a really important person, is uh, Reverend Singer. Um, the uh, Rabonim were often called Reverend because it sounded more English. This was another uh, Chief Rabbi Adler's uh, view of life as part of Minhag Anglia. So uh, Reverend Singer was actually a Rabbi, had Smicha, and um, he was born to Hungarian parents who sent him to Hungary at age eight for a better education. He had to come back because his mother um, died suddenly. And after his mother's death, it seems that his father never recovered and his business uh, collapsed, which meant that um, the young Reverend Singer, when he went off to um, Jews College, actually had to rely on a scholarship. And he then, uh, he would give lessons in German and in Latin to help support himself. Um, he was, by all accounts, a very erudite, very well-educated individual who spoke many languages. That he had um, an exceptional mind and he was an inspirational teacher and preacher. Um, his grave is on the opposite side from Nathan Adler. Oh, you can see in the picture, this crowd of people would all be crowding around Nathan Adler's the chief rabbi's grave um, at the back of the, on the Avenue of Trees. Um, he was uh, famous for the singer's prayer book, which is here in the pictures. And um, it's the siddle, which I would guess that most of us grew up with um, if you were a member of United Synagogue. And in fact, by 1970, 522,000 copies had been sold worldwide in 27 editions. Um, apparently, it's one of the most published books after the Bible. And the early editions, if you look here, were designed to look like the English Book of Common Prayer. Again, this idea of Minhag Anglia and being um, as English as, as possible. And it was one of the first prayer books that had an English translation in it um, as well. But um, he's a very interesting person. He had two pulpits. 
first at the Burrus Synagogue, uh, which I think closed in 1956, which was a poor community, mainly um, ministering to um, market traders of the old um, the old borough market, which is obviously quite different now. Um, but he was asked by Nathan Adler if he would go and become the minister to the newly opened New West End Synagogue, which is St. Petersburg Place. So he actually went from the poorest to the richest. But it said he never forgot the, um, forgot the poor people that he had uh, ministered to when he'd been in Borough. Um, so, very interesting man. There is lots and lots and lots written about him and um, could talk about him a lot more, but I won't and I will move on to um, Samuel Moses and he was the first person to be buried in the cemetery. So here's another view of his, to his uh, grave which we looked at before. Um, he was a businessman and he traded in the colonies and um, he was actually one of the founders of the first synagogue or I'd say the only synagogue in Hobart, Tasmania um, and he was the only mole. I mean I would, can't believe that in the 19th century there were Jews in Tasmania but seemingly um, there were. And um, he came back to or he came to England I don't know where he was born to say back and he wished to be buried in Wilson Jewish Cemetery and the story goes was that the cemetery wasn't ready at the time that he died and uh, because he was uh, an important well-respected person uh, the chief rabbi uh, came and consecrated the cemetery that morning to enable um, Samuel Moses' burial to take place in the afternoon. Um, so, um, I chose um, next to talk about Rosalind Franklin because she is one of the most visited graves in the cemetery. So a lot of um, non-Jewish people come to Wilson Cemetery because in the guidebooks they have read that Rosalind Franklin is buried here. Um, and she is um, she's famous as uh, contributing to being a key, the key, one of the key contributors to the discovery of DNA. Um, she was uh, educated in Cambridge, born into a large family in Notting Hill. And um, she studied at Cambridge and then um, went on to work in Paris, where um, she became skilled in the art of crystallography, of X-ray crystallography. And it was that skill which she used um, to actually produce the image of uh, the DNA structure, that it looked like a double, the famous double helix. She um, stayed in Paris for a number of years and then decided to come back to London uh, because she missed her family and she went to work at King's College London where a lot of research was going on led by Maurice Wilkins, uh, Francis Crick and uh, a third scientist Watson into DNA. And, there's, and this is where her history is a bit cloudy, is that uh, the three men took um, her X-ray photograph of this uh, structure of DNA and they used it within, and her notes, and they used it within their research to complete the work on DNA. And there's some, some question mark over whether she did or did not consent to them using, um, using her research. However, what is without any doubt that um, she died in 1958, but in 1962, Crick, Watson and Wilkins were awarded the Nobel Prize for their work on DNA, and they did not attribute her contribution to that work. They didn't mention her in their acceptance speeches of the Nobel Prize. 
Um, this was kind of surfaced um, in more recent years where there was a famous uh, play uh, called um, Photograph 51, uh, which um, was about her life. And she was portrayed as a female um, scientist who had been cheated and overlooked. Uh, by these three men who had uh, not acknowledged her contribution. And um, I think that's what's really made her famous to this generate to, to people of, um, to younger people today. She, um, she unfortunately died at a very young age of ovarian cancer and there's speculation that possibly it's her exposure to radiation in the work on X-ray crystallography that may have been the cause of her cancer. That's just speculation. Um, but um, there are now many um, institutions named after her. Uh, King's College London has a, a, a Rosalind Franklin building. And if you wander down behind Waterloo, you can see lots of pictures of her on the walls. And in fact, there is um, an Art Franklin School on, if anybody knows, Harvest Road in Queen's Park at the end, the Kensal Rise end, which is named after her, um, in recognition that kind of she's buried in Willston and they are a local, a local school. Um, her final thing to say about her is that her tombstone was is actually listed by Historic England and they listed it on an international women on International Women's Day in 2017. Um, the next person I chose to talk about is Herbert Samuel and um, uh, unlike Rosalind Franklin, I think he's kind of been a bit forgotten about, which um, I'm, uh, I find, I've always been intrigued by him. I had no idea he was buried in Willston and he's quite near the front and I was just wandering around. I thought, oh my God, it's Herbert Samuel. Um, because he was the first governor of British Mandate Palestine and um, I suppose, you know, I just remember from childhood, you know, being taught at Hayden Jewish history and Herbert Samuel always gets a, a mention. Um, he was born in Liverpool, but he came to London when he was five because his father died. And his guardian and his mentor was Samuel Montague of the Samuel Montague Bank. Now Samuel Montague was actually born Montague Samuel, but he changed his name for whatever uh, reason and um, he he encouraged um, Herbert Samuel um, to actually um, to pursue a career in politics. Um, Montague Samuel was a Liberal MP and Herbert Samuel followed in his footsteps as um, a Liberal MP for Whitechapel. So he's famous for two things, although, as I say, I think people have kind of forgotten about him a bit. Um, as I said, he was the first governor of British Mandate Palestine. And this photograph up here is a picture of a receipt um, that he signed when he was handed, uh, when he was appointed uh, governor, um, received from um, so Louis Bowles, One Palestine Complete. And there's a history book actually written uh, called One Palestine Complete. He, um, the interesting thing about his appointment was that he was very conflicted and it was a controversial appointment. He wrote to his son how worried he was about how acceptable he would be as a Jew. Um, and so he, because he was very uh, aware of people's perception, possible perceptions of his appointment, he went out of his way to be unbiased and to try and be as even handed as possible and unite the Jews and the Arabs under the British flag in, 18, in 1918. 
Um, so he accepted modern Hebrew as one of the three official languages in the mandate, English and Arabic being the other two. But he also appointed the Haji Amin al Husseini, who was a noted Arab nationalist and very, very hostile to Zionists, uh, to be the Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, as I'm sure, as you can imagine, um, in the end, he probably disappointed Jews and Arabs in equal measure. Um, and uh, as I guess he he realised was a danger when he took up the position. Um, but he came back to England and um, he also had a very long and illustrious career as a Liberal MP and he held many of the offices of state, including Home Secretary under Asquith in 1916. And he was also the first British politician to deliver a party political broadcast on television in the 1951 election. Um, he was leader of the Liberal Party in the House of Lords from 1944 to 1955. So it's, um, it's actually uh, the uh, centenary of his appointment in, or it was in July 2020. And I think if it hadn't have been for COVID, the cemetery would have marked this more actively. So, um, just got a few more people to mention. Um, there are many, many high street giants buried in the cemetery, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I would imagine you would have heard of all of them. Jack Cohen of Tesco's, who's buried with a very large gravestone near the front of the cemetery with his wife, Lady Sarah Cohen. Um, they were great philanthropists, and you probably all know Lady Sarah Cohen Care Home, which is near Muswell Hill. Um, Kurt Geiger the, uh, of the Shoe Empire. Um, the Kurt Guy, he sold the Kurt Geiger shops um, about uh, long, many years ago, and there's very little known about his history, but he was actually born in Vienna and had wanted to be a doctor. Um, but had to leave medical school and move, he went to Australia as a refugee from the Nazis. Um, and then um, Harriet Samuel of H. Samuel, the jewellers. Everybody, I think, assumes the H in H. Samuel is Henry or Herbert, but it's not, it's Harriet. Um, and uh, apart from um, building up the, with her husband, the business of H. Samuel, um, she was one of the first people to develop male order. Um, the, her, the business was sold in 1996. So they're just three of very many um, people in the cemetery um, who were reta famous retailers. There's also a number of artists in the cemetery. Um, I've just pulled out Mark Gertler uh, because people may recognise the merry-go-round, which is a very famous painting. Um, every time I talk about this, I'm struck by how haunting it is because um, he was a conscientious objector in the First World War. And this painting is um, captures the horror here's the horror that he felt at the war. If you look at the expressions on the faces of the soldiers and the people on the merry-go-round and the whole notion of this going round and round and the futility of, um, of war. Um, he, um, he had a um, difficult life. He suffered from depression. He had TB and um, he died at a very young age and unfortunately he took his own life in 1939 on the outbreak of the um, Second World War. Two other artists who are in the cemetery, um, Solomon J. Solomon and Simeon Solomon. 
just to say about Solomon J. Solomon, um, one of his famous paintings uh, called The Field, which is a picture of his daughter on a pony, actually sits in the entrance of the Nightingale home. And that's because um, his daughter was a resident in the Nightingale home until she died at age 97. And then her daughter, so his granddaughter Anne, also lived at Nightingale. And her son, Patrick Bower, so that would be his great grandson, um, has for many years been a Nightingale GP. So there's a very strong family connection to the Nightingale home. Um, this grave, Simeon uh, Solomon, um, he was, um, his artist, his grave was restored in 2014 through uh, crowd funding. Um, he was very, very popular in the mid 19th century, uh, but he fell out of favor because he was gay. He battled with alcoholism and he was arrested in a public toilet for indecency, after which he was dropped by society and um, he died in a workhouse. And um, he, again, has he's been recognised in more recent times and restored to his rightful place. Um, I sometimes think of him as the Alan Turing of um, Muslim Jewish Cemetery. Then um, finally, you can't really talk about Wilson Cemetery without mentioning the Rothschilds because there are actually 23 Rothschilds buried in Wilson Cemetery. So just to mention um, Sir Lionel de Rothschild, who was the first Jewish MP um, elected in 1847, but he couldn't take his seat because um, there was a, you had to take a Christian oath on uh, entering parliament. Um, but he took his seat in 1858 when the uh, oath was amended. Um, so he, um, his son was Lionel Nathan de Rothschild, Natty Rothschild, who is buried um, next to him, you can't see in this picture. Um, and he was the first Jewish member of the House of Lords. So um, that is a real whistle top tour. I'm just looking at the time. Um, this is uh, these are some pictures of the new visitor centre, which has been fun. The renovation was funded by the lottery. Um, there are plans for walks, exhibitions, audio visual displays, and everything got knocked back because of. COVID. Uh, the plan now is to open for the formal opening to take place on the 7th of September and I'm hoping during the autumn we can start actually taking people on um, actual tours of the cemetery. Um, you're all welcome to visit. This is a picture of Hester who's been the driver uh, behind the lottery grant, um, giving a talk to a tour of people. And um, just the final slide is to say we have a newsletter and we have lots of future events. Um, and if you want to sign up for them, that's our website um, name. And uh, our events are on Eventbrite as well, where you can book in. And they're normally free. Um, there's, um, there's this, for example, apart from the opening on the 7th of September, there are three, a couple, three established well-known authors are talking about their subjects who are buried at Wilsdon Cemetery called Past Mastery, Life, Life Stories from Wilsdon Cemetery. And uh, there's a talk on the 10th of September on what makes a successful memoir, which looks very interesting if anybody here is thinking of writing their own um, memoir. And if you are interested in volunteering, uh, there's a section you can sign up on the cemetery. Um, apart from tour guides, there are people volunteering doing re research into particular aspects of the cemetery. 
and there was also a team of volunteer gardeners if anybody is interested in that and that uh, brings me to the end of my talk so i shall i um, um if i unshare my screen please and then we can have the pleasure of actually seeing everybody That's it. right Great. Uh, well, first of all, a fantastic thank you to Deborah for a remarkable talk. I learned a great deal, although I hadn't expected to, but I did. Um, and I'm delighted to know where uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, was buried. Uh, the lady, sadly, was A, female, and B, died, so she missed out on the Nobel Prize, which she should have received. <laughs> Prize, Whoever it is who's uh, telephoning, please mute. Um, now, I am sure there will be comments and questions, and rather than a total free-for-all, if you'd like to wave or do something like that, then we can take you all in order. So, questions? Any questions? Well, while you're all thinking, I shall ask, uh, is the cemetery still functional? It is, but only if you have a grave um, booked. So there are no more um, places being uh, being allocated. So uh, it probably has about half a dozen funerals a year and, and stone settings. Great. All right. Back to questions. Questions, questions? How many, how many, oh, not many. How many graves are there all together at Wilson? Uh, it's uh, 26,000 people oh. apparently. Seven generations of people. And it is incredibly uh, crowded and higgly piggly, really. It's not beautifully gridded or laid out and it can be incredibly difficult to find a particular grave. <laughs> Do I remember that some planting is being done under the lottery? Yes, or... that's right. Yeah, quite, a, quite uh, with the team of volunteer gardeners, quite um, uh, because because of the pressure on space, um, very little attention was paid to, to that aspect of the cemetery. And we're trying to put that right now. Yeah. Is that to bring it back to the garden status it had originally? Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. How would one get there by public transport, please? Um, you, the nearest tube is um, Dollis Hill Station. And you go out the Chaplin Road end and walk. It's probably a 10 minute walk, max. It's not very far at all. And then there's quite a lot of buses that go down that way. Um, I think the 260, is it, from Golders Green? Um, I know most of the bus is going up from the south, the number six and the number eight. That's probably not much good. But Doris Hill is the nearest tube. Thank you. Ruth Sober, you had a question or comment? Yes. Have you ever had any vandalism in the cemetery? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, it's... it's, it's um, quite well it's quite a secure place so it's the entrance is walled with a big gate and then because it's bounded by two other cemeteries oh and there's a small part which is the park which has high walls uh no not really and there's an on-site caretaker good yeah. uh, do you have to book for the potential guided walks if and when they ever actually happen yes but they're all you can book through eventbrite or through united synagogue events or indeed the website uh, uh, yeah and lions you had a question uh, you probably better unmute yourself or get closer to your microphone because we can't hear you 
No, still can't hear you. Oh gosh. Mute. Right, try again. Are children buried separately? Yes, on the um, side which abuts um, the Christian cemetery, uh -huh. there is a separate area for children. Uh, that's, um, I think that's Victorian though. I'm not sure that's the case today. But yes, there is a separate mm. area. Sorry. Questions? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, if, if somebody today um, takes their own life, do, do they have to be buried apart from everybody else? No. And that's never been the case because um, it's one of, I think, the fundamental differences between Judaism and Catholicism. We don't have that idea that your, your soul is damned for eternity, which was back in the day a view of uh, in Catholicism. I don't know if it still is. In um, Jewish life, there's no differentiation made at all. If you have um, no, taken no. your own life. And there are, and I can think there are, um, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, the artist Solomon, the two artists, Mark, Mark Gertler, um, but there's uh, the late Eric Miller, MP, who yeah. took his own life um, in the 80s, I mm. think. He was buried near the front. No, not at all. Yes, I will. Thank you. More? Another question? How do we do it? More questions? We no. seem to have run out, which is remarkable. Uh, any more questions? Do shout if, if I've missed you. How many are there sharing the screen? 27 it was over 30. Right. In that case, I shall be very, very pleased to say once again on everybody's behalf a big thank you to Deborah for yeah. a really, really interesting and informative talk and a huge round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, nice great. See you all. Thank you. Now, before you all go away, um, our last talk before Rosh Hashanah is in two weeks' time, on the 9th of September, uh, which promises to be uh, both interesting and possibly a little challenging or contentious, uh, when Professor Adrian Lister is talking to us with the title finding Darwin's God. Um, Adrian is a research leader in the Department of Earth Sciences, the Natural History Museum, was a professor of paleobi paleobiology at University College. Uh, he's a member of Finchley Progressive School and organizes adult learning programs there and he lives in Muswell Hill. Uh, and the theme of his talk is how can we reconcile the biblical version of creation with modern theories of evolution uh, and can we actually do that and how would you deal with these apparently conflicting ideas and he invites you to uh, come to the talk and discuss your views as to how or if it's possible to do that and I look forward to seeing you half past two Wednesday the 9th of September and again, Deborah, thank you very, very yeah. much. On I wish you all a very early Happy New Year before we get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.